Welcome to AP European History with Dr. Borovkin. Today we have a, a very important topic, which is called Bismarck and Unification of Germany. So, this is a huge topic, and there are books and books and books written about uh, Bismarck and about unification of Germany, one of the most important events of 19th century, because out of 33 tiny little principalities, a huge modern, most powerful state of Europe was created. Indeed, by the, uh, essentially by the energy and wisdom and work of one man, Otto von Bismarck. Like the unification of Italy, it was Act Two, a very similar. Act One is 1848 revolution uh, in Europe, specifically in Germany, as you recall, the Frankfurt Parliament uh, offered the crown of uh, united Germany to uh, Frederick William IV, the King of Prussia, who refused. Uh, and then, of course, nothing came out of it, and it, the thing just kind of hang in the air. Uh, nothing happened until the year 1862, which is when unification begins. In 1862, Frederick William IV dies, and the new king of Prussia comes to the throne, whose name is Wilhelm I. And immediately he appoints as chancellor Otto von Bismarck, very similar to the story of Vittorio Emanuel of Piedmont, who appointed Cavour, who put things in motion that led to the unification of Italy. Now, it's very important, 1862 is the year when Italy had already been unified, except Veneto, which was still Austrian, and except Rome, which was uh, under the Pope. So in a sense, you could say Otto von Bismarck had an example of a successful unification uh, of a country like Italy. He gave a very important speech in 1862 when he said, I paraphrase, uh, unification will not be done by uh, declarations and by voting. It would be done by blood and iron. And this is like a famous quote that everybody refers to, blood and iron. What did he mean by blood and iron? Well, essentially he meant but iron is a metaphor for force. And blood, it would mean war. You cannot do it without war. So in a sense, he is uh, hinting uh, since what's going to happen, it would take a war, or maybe more than one, as it turned out, three uh, wars in order to accomplish unification of uh, Germany. Now, before we do uh, specific uh, steps that Bismarck undertake, undertook, let me explain a little bit about his personality. I mean, Otto von Bismarck, who is this guy? What is his worldview? Uh, and how did he approach politics? Now, my personal view is that Otto von Bismarck is one of the most remarkable personalities of 19th century, maybe even uh, of both 19th and 20th, even though uh, there were a lot of remarkable ones in 20th as well. He's certainly one of the most talented politicians and most successful politicians of the 19th century. Uh, he, the quote that I like so much uh, of him that I even wanted to post it here in this room is uh, politics is the art of the possible. Politics is the art of the possible, Otto von Bismarck. What he means by that is that the political game uh, is, is only, you can only be successful if you do what is possible. If you try to do the impossible, you'll fail. So the job of a politician is to guess right what is possible in the current circumstances and not to try to do the impossible. Now, the implication basically is that Napoleon tried to do the impossible and he failed. You have to know where to stop. And I think in historical perspective, when we evaluate the work of uh, Otto von Bismarck, one of the most remarkable things is that, is that he knew when to stop. Uh, and that is probably the most remarkable thing. He knew when to stop rather than to go all the way uh, along the lines of Napoleon Bonaparte, s'engager et puis en bois. You know, first you engage and then you see what you can get away with. No, he knew exactly what he wanted and he knew where to stop. He's also known as the author of a theory which is called real politique, which means pretty much the same thing, what is possible in real conditions. 
Also, uh, Otto von Bismarck is a nobleman. He's from the uh, Junkers, which means the East Prussian uh, landowners, who is extremely loyal to the king, who has this uh, sort of a moral code of absolute loyalty to the king. He's a kind of a, a knight uh, in the modern version of it, of, of loyalty and service to the king and to his country. Another quality of Bismarck is, is Machiavellian. He is totally Machiavellian. If you read Machiavelli and if you follow what uh, Bismarck is doing, he is Machiavellian in the sense of uh, raison d'etat. In other words, he is ready to do anything, and I mean anything, for the well-being of his state and his king. And what I mean by that, if, if, if you need to get in touch with uh, terrorists and anarchists uh, and revolutionaries of Hungary to undermine your enemy, which is at this moment the Habsburgs, you can do it. That's fine. If you need to do some other unsavory things for the benefit of your country, that's fine too. So that is what I mean Machiavellian. In a sense, there's no moral restraint, uh, or almost none, in terms of what you are supposed to do for the success of your enterprise of your country. And in fact, he did get in touch with Hungarian revolutionaries when the war with Austria did come about. So let's we'll go over what exactly he did step by step in order to understand unification of Germany. Now, what is the goal? The goal is to unify Germany. What is Germany is the first question. What is the state of Germany in 1862? In 1862, you have 30-something uh, small principalities that are all organized into the so-called German Confederation, which are all sovereign states. They all have their own currency, their own state of government, their own uh, laws, their own borders, their own armed forces, their own everything, uh, but they are united into the German Confederation, which the head of it is a Habsburg, which is essentially an Austrian emperor. But it is very loose, and they're all absolutely sovereign, uh, but they do have an imperial diet, and it really didn't change that much from the 1500s when uh, the emperor was elected the uh, Charles V, an Austrian. Uh, so that's the situation. The only thing different uh, compared to the 1500s is that you do have a new organization which is set, set up by Prussia in, 18, in 1832, which is called Zollverein, uh, which means a, um, a toll union or a customs union. Uh, which is essentially unites most of the German states, uh, and they don't pay taxes when they cross the borders of commodities. In other words, it's a kind of a common market, uh, similar to the common market of the 1950s, where you have free trade zone uh, of most German states. That is the only difference. And the Zollverein is led by Prussia rather than Austria. So this is a kind of an inbuilt advantage. The second uh, important factor is, is the precedent of 1848. And the precedent means something that happened. And uh, the German states did assemble and did offer the crown, not to the Habsburg, but to the Hohenzollern in Berlin, to Prussia, which means that there was already a kind of a preeminence of Prussia uh, over Austria. Why is there this preeminence? Well, there's two things. Number one. Austria is on the southwest, and it is not the, uh, the center of rising industry. The center of rising industry is Westphalia, and Westphalia was given to Prussia, uh, and therefore a, a province that is detached from the main body of Prussia, which is Berlin and Brandenburg, uh, Westphalia is turning out to be the center of industrialization, and it does belong to Prussia. Now, between them, there's Hanover and all the other principalities and free cities like Hamburg, and, and they are ports, and they depend on uh, commodities that are being produced in Westphalia and Prussia and the center of Germany. So they're, in a sense, linked economically much more to Prussia than they are to southern Germany, a Catholic Bavaria, which is still looking up to Austria. In other words, the slow preeminence of economic 
development of the north of Germany uh, does work for Prussia and it is slowly becoming much more important, powerful and desirable as a center. The third reason for Prussian preeminence is that it's completely German. There, there's essentially no non-Germans except for a small Polish minority uh, in Prussia. Uh, but Austria is, is tied up uh, with its possession of Hungary and then through Hungary to Croatia and its interests in the Balkans uh, and of course the Czech lands. So it is like the Germans are a minority in the Austro-Hungarian Empire or at that time called the Habsburg Empire. And, and that also puts it, it's a disadvantage uh, in terms of competition for the leadership of German states. Nevertheless, if we look at Germany of 1862, uh, it's very simple. The North is kind of looking up to Prussia uh, and the South, which means Bavaria, Baden-Württemberg, uh, a Catholic South is looking up to Austria. And it's a kind of a clear line uh, north and south uh, of uh, whose sympathies are where. Now, I read several articles that discuss what would have happened if there had been no Bismarck. Could that German confederation led by Habsburgs have continued? Would it have been a different history of the world and different history of Europe? The answer, yes, to both questions. It could have continued and it would have been a different history because this kind of confederation uh, does exist in, the, in, in Switzerland. That is exactly the kind of confederation, self-governing states that are loosely connected into one statehood, but all of them run their own affairs and except the military and one currency, they don't really uh, much connect and the federal government is very weak. So yes, it could have continued under Austrian leadership and there could have been continuously small states uh, that are coordinating their economic policy. It was unlikely but it was possible. It was unlikely because Prussia was very dynamic uh, and it had, as I said before, inbuilt desire to connect, uh, to connect Westphalia to the main body of Prussia. They were not physically connected. There was a, a gap in between, which is Hanover, when you look at the map. Now, obviously, if you have one of your most powerful provinces, not connected to your main body of your territory. You, as a normal leader, would want to connect it and swallow up Hanover and any other obstacles that exist so that you have a continuous territory of your country. So uh, Bismarck faces two obstacles. He has pretty much the support of the German states. He has the preeminence, but uh, the two obstacles are basically Austria and France. Nothing new. These were the adversaries or allies or opponents of uh, Prussia for uh, at least a century and a half. So he has to define a, a plan of how to overcome these two difficulties. And here we come to uh, unification of Germany by Bismarck in three stages and in fact three wars. So let's go to act one of this drama uh, and that's stage one and that's war number one. And that is um, uh, not really a war, even though technically it is a war, over Schleswig-Holstein. So Schleswig-Holstein is a German province in the very, very north, uh, where it borders on uh, Denmark. Uh, and even called today, it's called Schleswig-Holstein. By the way, it was uh, Peter III of Russia who was brought and raised uh, in Schleswig-Holstein, uh, this is the guy who saluted to Frederick the Great and who was uh, overthrown by his, husband, by his wife, uh, Catherine II of Russia. So Schleswig-Holstein affair is like this. Schleswig-Holstein is a German province, but it had a, Schleswig had a personal union with the Danish king, which means that it was a kind of a weird situation that it was a part of the uh, German confederation, but it had a personal union with a Danish king. Uh, and uh, Bismarck uh, decided to play up on the nationalist uh, sentiment in Germany uh, through the, these societies like uh, Carbonari in Italy. There were these German societies of Bruderschaften, these sort of brotherhoods 
uh, and he uh, got Austria on board. That was his diplomatic achievement to try to get Schleswig-Holstein to be completely German. The, uh, uh, the um, situation that arose was that the Danish king had a foolish uh, idea to declare not just a personal union with Schleswig, but that he, it would be a part of Denmark, that it would be annexed to Denmark. That was a casus belli, that is to say, a cause of war. Uh, and Bismarck immediately managed to get Austria on board, saying, this is our German lands and the Austrians are taking them over, so we have to do something about it. And they agreed to go to war against Denmark. Now, there was not really much of a war. The German troops basically crossed into Schleswig. There was hardly any resistance, and they took it over. The advantage was for Bismarck that he did it together with Austria. And the agreement was that it would be a, a joint action and that uh, Schleswig would be governed by uh, Prussia and Holstein, the southern part, would be governed by Austria. Uh, and this is the first successful step uh, of uh, Bismarck and Prussia enlarging its territory to the north uh, and creating a situation uh, that uh, now Prussia is on the march to unify Germany. Now it is 16 minutes and I'm going to have to stop this segment and we will continue in the next segment about the next two steps that Bismarck will undertake to unify Germany. Don't forget to tell your friends. Thank <laughs> you.